Thank you, everyone. Lots of familiar faces here today, which I'm very happy to see. So it looks like whatever industry we say we're in, uh, it looks like we follow a mutual path. Um, this morning, I have learned a lot about service design. I have also learned something about service designers. I've learned that uh, just like other designers, service designers like to wear black. Uh, I have also learned that uh, Service designers love to drink Club Mate, uh, just like normal designers. And I've learned that sometimes the slides, even in service design, can be very full of information. Um, what I would like to talk today maybe takes the focus a little bit away from the basics of service design to looking at service design from a broader perspective and uh, buzzword or magic methods, just exploring, you know, how does service design influence the way we work? And also maybe where is design, service design not the right method or what can we actually do? What, what do we have to look out for when we work in service design? I, I think Alexander always said, already said so much about me, but uh, my background in design, innovation and corporate change. And today at Inch Pickerman, I am responsible for what we call overall strategy. My personal mission is to support people to change and grow personally because I think that if everyone in organizations looked at change as a possibility to grow instead of a threat, I think that uh, this place would be a much better place to work, this earth would be a much better place to be and the corporations would be much nicer places to work. I joined in Spiekermann only one and a half years ago, whoops. Um, and uh, what I especially like by Inch Pickerman and one of the reasons why I chose Inch Pickerman and not a different organization was because um, of the 97 people from very diverse and, and uh, different backgrounds. So that's something which I feel is really special about Inch Pickerman. 15 nations, that's definitely something to be proud of, but what's even more to be proud of is lots of different skills. And here is the picture about how we all work together that has to be in every presentation. This is just to show that in our office, coders and designers work hand in hand and create better results, I think, together. So looking at uh, what has changed in our industry and how it affects us, I think would be appropriate to do today. And uh, one of the big movements that we are watching everywhere is how um, we have moved from corporate to social. So when I started in the industry, this is many, many years ago, I, uh, it was all about uh, corporate design. It was about designing the visuals of organization, how they looked. It was about designing great um, uh, design manuals and controlling the output and the look of organizations worldwide. Uh, later, it moved into being more about the brand messages, but still very much push, so still very much what is it that organizations actually want to talk to the world about in their product and in their brand messages. Moving towards the millennium, it was began to, uh, the focus began to shift towards the people outside the organizations and we began to talk about the brand experience. So what should, what should people actually experience when they interact with this organization or with this product? And what's happening today is that it's much more about social interaction and about service and the service um, experience. So what has changed a lot is the focus and the importance of design research. Just on a personal note, I think it's interesting that um, the first design research method was actually developed in the 1970s in Scandinavia, so it's not like we're talking. I think it's very important also to state that we're not talking about a new phenomenon here. We're talking about something that's been around with very different expressions as tools and as methods for a very, very long time. But it began to take its place in our industry just around this time and it has become more and more important. Now with the focus on social, a lot of things have changed in the organizations we work with and I think uh, we all know all these changes. Um, 
it's not anymore, organizations are not what they used to be, the structures have changed, the hierarchies have changed, the ways decisions are made have changed. And what that means is actually that um, people find new ways of working together. Things are not gradual processes, the, 90, the 2000s or around the millennium processes would be scheduled in our organizations and they would be rolled out. You would talk about months and months of planning, of strategies, and now you actually talk about only weeks or sprints in only days. So the paradigm shift that's taking place right now from corporate to social actually means a lot to the way designers uh, think and the way they act and it challenges us, but it also challenges the, our clients because they have to rethink and react the way they interact with us. So today brands are much more about contributing. As I already said, it's not anymore just about pushing messages, brand messages out into the world. Um, a good service, I think has been said enough today, has become more important than a good product. And more importantly, I think it is to realize that um, we are not the only experts anymore. So the times where the designers would lock themselves in a room and create the solutions and come out with a black box and say, da da, this is it, are over. And this is something that also designers and the whole design culture, being people who like to think that there's something very special, have to live with and have to deal with. Um, I know this is a little bit um, provocative, but I think in many cases and in many organizations uh, we begin to see this thinking, which is not new, but which is right now becoming more and more important, take uh, the place of traditional marketing tools and traditional marketing methods. So what I would like to look at and show you is how service design today influences the way we work at Inch Pickerman. Um, some, we have some disciplines that are directly related to um, service design, but we also have some that are not. So where we come from and what's fundamental in the way we act and think is what uh, we call identity and brand design. So it's still about culture and it's still visuali about vi visualizing and put putting words on how corporations like to interact and communicate with the world around them. Um, what's becoming increasingly uh, important for us and for the world as such is the um, business area that we have where we produce, where we in develop digital products and services. This, I think, is a dis business area that, if it's not already existing in the design world, in all the design agencies, it's really about time to establish it because on the second quarter of this year, for the first time in Europe, more mobile devices were sold than PCs. So the world is mobile, and I think that the way designers think and the way designers create should also be able to talk the language and develop the products for a mobile. Because designers have all, all, always been change agents, uh, we have a business area that we call enabling change. What that is about, I would like to show in a few cases right now, rather than talking about it um, in a more abstract way. The last business area which we have uh, developed during the last, um, since 2009, is uh, the business area of service design, which I don't think needs any introduction today. What we find is, as I've already said, that service design influences the way we work in all areas, but what's even more important is that all the other areas of disciplines and uh, business areas uh, we work in also affect the way we look at service design. So yes, service design is a method and sometimes we use it, but also sometimes we don't. And I think it's very important to make conscien cho conscious choices in when you use it and when you don't. So just quickly, I would like to take you through three through three cases that I've chosen. I've chosen them because they're not classic service design cases, but because they do this, they look at how service design influenced the way we work and the outcome. One case study is about how to successfully introduce a new technology. 
And the next is about how to create a service culture, so that's about branding. And the third one is about to make, how to make a change process relevant for people in an organization. So, um, the first case, uh, case uh, is for a service provider, and I like the fact that Reitzer said um, mobile payment, that's something he's a little bit afraid of. Uh, this is what this case is about. Uh, one of our clients is a payment service provider, and he had developed, they had developed a new um, technology, which is that you can transfer money from one mobile phone to the other by bumping the mobile phones together. And this, for a lot of people, is pretty scary. So they came to us and said, we need to introduce this new technology. What we would normally do is we would write a white paper and then we would go around to our clients like Telecom or um, other organizations and try to sell this technology. But we're not very successful in doing so. What can you do? We don't have a very big budget, and maybe the day after tomorrow, someone else will launch this technology on the market. So we need you to do find a solution fast. And what we did in this case was that we actually worked in weekly sprints. So every week we would develop a new step in this, um, in this solution, and then we would talk to our client and say, say is someone else on the market? Is, has it been introduced? And if not, we would continue for another week. What we did, and the answer to um, their question was to develop a very, very quickly designed prototype of the transaction. So it was a mobile app that actually worked and that uh, enabled uh, us to test the transaction and this bumping technology and see how people react. Now, this was not a service design project that took months and months. It was just a very nice little project where we um, developed a screen flow and uh, coded it and designed it very brief and very roughly, and we tested it with a bunch of people. So it was not a design research project that took a long time. It was really just a quick, um, a quick test and a quick prototype. But what we found was some pieces of interesting information about how people's reactions and barriers, mental barriers, were against this, uh, this new mobile technology. So actually we found that this bumping, people found it pretty scary because they thought it was not enough to, they needed some kind of extra verification. So after having developed the service design blueprint, again very roughly, we ended up with a prototype that had a different user flow that we would have come up with if we had not done the testing. Um, but I think if you look at service design and what it can do in digital technology, I think rapid prototyping allowed our client to sell the technology and introduce the technology in a completely different way than they would have done if they had written a right paper. And secondly, I think with a work working prototype, they could sell a white label app and get new clients in a completely different way. The second case study is about how brands are very, um, from my point of view, are very important for creating a service culture in the organizations. And uh, the example I would like to use here, the case study is a company, a German company, one of these hidden German champions that I really admire. They're called Otto Bock and they do orthesis and prothesis, that is uh, um, artificial arms and legs for people and other helping aids for people with disabled people. And um, what's very clearly shown, I think, in this example of uh, what they looked before, is that uh, they had a very strong focus on technology. So these legs and arms are some of the most advanced pieces of technology in the world, and they are market leaders. But what became very obvious when we worked with them was that their view of people, of their clients, of their users, was actually that they were users of their technology. So I don't know how you feel when you see that picture, but I wouldn't want to be one of the people standing there. Um, so what we did was that we 
found out, we talked about them, of, about how they need, f fundamentally needed to change the way they looked at people and the way they looked at their users before they could create a service culture in their company that would actually be able to embrace the fact that uh, this company was not about only about creating um, great technology, but also about creating designing for people who have an everyday life. And uh, with a team of people, we, took, we went out and we visited um, some of the users. So these are our people visiting some users of uh, these um, technology of these legs and arms. And we found uh, that we, when we explored the full service value chain, we found some very interesting um, connections and relationships between the users and especially the technicians. Because we, I don't know if you know, I didn't know that when you get a new leg or a new arm, it actually takes months and months before this arm and this technology is adjusted to the movements of your body. So some very interesting and some very deep um, relationships actually were developed during this period between the users and the technicians. But we looked at what we looked at were the underlying motivations. So what is it actually that all of these people have in common when they th think about uh, this brand and when they think about this technology? And we found out that it had a lot to do with this. It had a lot to do with how people can actually be a part of just having a normal life. So this little boy in this wheelchair, I'm sure he's not thinking about the wheelchair. He's just very, very proud of being a part of the crowd with his friends and being able to play with them and take part in what they did. So we found that this brand was actually about independence and quality for life. Now, when you look at this man brand message, independence and quality for life, this is a completely different um, basis for creating a service culture because what they do at Otto Borg now is that they sell quality for life and that enables the, the, uh, the people in the organization to understand what the motivations are behind the people that they actually treat. And when we introduced the uh, product in the US, we looked a lot about telling stories about the partnerships between the technicians and the users. These so are just some very nice imagery where I don't know if you know it, but it's nice and show in the picture that these people actually use artificial legs and uh, arms. So to sum up service design and branding, I think uh, it can be a part of shifting the culture from technology focus to creating true value for all the stakeholders. And I think uh, that can enable you to uh, focus on personal stakeholders and the relationships behind them. When we talk about cultural change, I think that uh, service design can play a big role here. And the reason why I do it is um, because I think that when organizations decide that they want to change something in their organization, they very often forget about t thinking about why they want to change this. So boardroom decisions thinks a lot about the corporate strategy, but it forgets the personal and the human perspective behind it. Um, and this case study is for, for one of our big clients, Bosch. I don't think it needs any introduction, but they uh, set out to use diversity as a competitive advantage. So instead of trying to um, look at at, uh, at work on to work at cultural borders and uh, and develop different corporate cultures in different kind in different places in the world they tried to look at diversity and see it as an advantage and what they did was that they um, laid out a strategy that would gradually introduce different aspects of, of diversity into the organizations starting with gender diversity so um, they came to us and asked us to do an internal communication campaign about seeing and helping people see diversity as a advantage as opposed to being afraid of mixing with people who are different from themselves. So the first step was that we created a general awareness 
for the um, subject, so I think this image about gender diversity doesn't need any more introduction. Um, it's the fact that not many of women are in managing positions in this big organization. Uh, even on a worldwide perspective, it's still under 10%. And uh, this campaign, this is just another aspect of the campaign, but the second um, step was that we looked at and explored what diversity meant for these 20,000 managers worldwide who were the target group in our campaign. So diversity, especially gender diversity, has a completely different meaning in the Japanese culture, in the Chinese culture, in the American culture, or in the European culture. But what we tried to do was we tried to identify people who had actually created great results with diversity. So we identified 40 managers and uh, worked with these 40 managers on how to tell their personal story and how to actually have them be role models for the change. So what we did was we changed the focus from being corporate driven, we want to reach some corporate goals, to being personal driven, talking about how it can actually be a personal advantage for these people to embrace diversity and not be afraid of it. And these role models were all managers and we did a lot of films with them, they talked on conferences, etc., etc. So I think that service design can be a very um, important tool in change processes because it allows, to, allows organizations to find out what is it that their culture is and to root the changes in the organizational culture rather than in the corporate strategies. And it focuses on personal motivations and the relevance not in the underlying strategies. Um, this is just a recent challenge that um, an organization came to us and said, we want to implement an idea-driven culture. So this is again a boardroom decision, we want to implement an idea-driven culture. And they had thought about the how, and what they had come up with was a solution that they called Free Tuesdays. So one Tuesday every month, they would say, to their employees in this marketing department, no telephone, no meetings, no internet. So now is the time to create ideas. And guess what? It didn't work. Because it wasn't rooted in the culture, it didn't answer all these questions. It didn't make people understand why, they contribu why their contribution was important. It didn't make them understand the process of how they generated ideas. It didn't make them understand how, where they, how they should get their inspiration, when they should do it, should they sit together, should they read a newspaper. It didn't answer all these questions. So what we have proposed and I hope will happen is to conduct a service design project, make a little customer journey about how our ideas actually generated today in the organization. Find out when, because there are people in there creating great ideas, uh, but also maybe find out where do the breakdowns happen. Um, so again, service design, I think, can be a very strong tool in internal processes because it can identify breakdowns in cultures and because it can look at what are people's motivations for change and because it can create new processes based on the actual good examples in the organizations today. So just the last two minutes, three important lessons we have learned that I would like to share with you when working with service design is that um, one of the first of them is that, um, yes, you might get the job, clients might ask you to conduct a service design process, but you might find that it's not as easy as you thought it was because this is what the organization looked like. There's still very, the, the uh, service design looks at the organization from a customer perspective. It doesn't care about what department people sit in or what decisions they can make. So if marketing doesn't talk to sales and so sales doesn't talk to online marketing and online marketing doesn't talk to whoever, it can be a very costly process 
to conduct a service design process, do a lot of user research and come up with the idea of creating a birthday card for the customers because that's the only thing you could actually implement. So I think it's very important for us to, to look at, oops, sorry. Excuse me. Um, Hello. To look at decision making processes and in the role we have also be very aware of the fact that we don't, shouldn't start a process that we cannot really implement or cannot really fi finish. And the second one is the question if service design is always worth it because sometimes I think the expectations to the process can be very, very high, but at the end of it, the re return on investment is just really not holding up with this big investment. So what is a real return on investment of a 200,000 euro exploration process for an organization? If you cannot really document that very well, if you're not really sure of that return on investment, my advice would be, don't just start the process because it's cool to sell courts, um, service design right now. And one of my third learnings are, where do the good ideas come from? So this one is very old, I know, it's from 1939, but I think it's still very relevant. You can't ask people about new ideas. You can ask them and the questions, the answers you get are always related to today or to the past. But our role as a designer is, is to create for the future. So when you conduct design research, be aware of the fact that what you look at are reactions to technologies, products and services that we have today and not to in the, for the future. And I also think, and it's been seen before and it's been said today before, sorry, um, that you can actually research yourself to death and at the end the idea that comes out of it is not always worth it. So at one point you just need to make a leap, you need to free yourself as from the research and you need to just go in there and create the great idea. So ending it, I think yes, service design, buzzword or magic method, it can be a very strong tool but I think it needs a much broader scope to create a sustainable value. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. Great. And now, <coughs> oh, you already hear like my voice. Is Questions? Like. Questions? And now I even have two hands free, so I can't come and check you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, well, we had somebody here, we had, perfect. Um, hi, first of you, thank you for your um, lecture. It was very interesting, your perspective. I'm, I'm having a, a company background, so my question, you, having, you were having these uh, three silos with R&D, sales, um, and marketing. Um, first, who, uh, who do you work with? Um, wh which uh, segment do you do you talk to? With what kind of people? And how would you um, change it? How would you change the organization even? Um, we very often work with um, organizations who have a strong technology focus, but not always. Uh, the last organization we worked for had a pure service focus and there was no technology involved with it. So the focus are very different. Secondly, what I would do, what we do is that uh, we sit together with the clients um, and make sure that they have a strategy for implementing the changes before they start the process. So we look at where are important ambassadors that needs to be a part of the process before it starts. We identify those. We look at the service design experience. What are the major stakeholders internal? Who are they? 
involved in this, uh, being able to decide for these changes, and we try to get them around the table as early as possible. Um, but who hires you? Like, is it is it R&D? Is it marketing? Like, I guess marketing or like? It's it can be sales, can be marketing, can also be R&D. This is where the starting to get fussy. It's also you know. Um, starting to get a little bit fussy, what are you an agency for? But I think basically it is mostly it's sales and marketing and rarely it can also be R&D. One little thing I would quickly share um, is like from, so, so I'm working for Nokia and mm -hmm. our perspective is, uh, perspective is often, um, uh, so we, we are having some externals um, and there's like one agency they tend to always work embedded with our teams. And mm -hmm. this has really a different impact um, when, on the other hand, other um, agencies like, tend to work on their side, just mm -hmm. and then come in every whatever mm -hmm. uh, week. But if they're really embedded mm -hmm. um, and there's really a knowledge sharing constantly going on, this really creates more value for um, the company. This is like just my Personal yes, uh, we experience. do that in projects. Ableton, we work for right now. We work for Red Bull Music Academy, and these have been there have been people constantly sitting in our office and developing with us on these projects. So yes, I agree with you, but it's not always possible. It's if you do that, I think it's great. I worked for Nokia in the past also, and I've got to know the culture. But not all organizations sure. have gone them, come this far yet. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for one more question. No more questions. Thank you, Pia. Bitte.